been named one of the top DJs in the world and has been spinning for over 20 years. Please welcome Mark Farina. How's Hello. it going? Excellent. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now, did you start out wanting to be a DJ? Um, I mean, well, yeah, I just wanted to be a DJ. I wasn't planning to do anything beyond that, just become a DJ. But the first time I saw a DJ carrying his trolley of records back then, it was like DJs would carry like a carpenter's trolley of records. Um, I was going to clubs at an early age, teens, like 15, 14, 16, and I finally, you know, found where the DJ booth was and saw 1200s and I was kind of hooked once I saw what they were doing and moving the pitch and stuff. So, yeah, so I was like, oh, I want to do that because I had records already, but I didn't really know that people mixed them. Right. So you've been all around the world. You've been DJing for years. You've seen a lot of changes in the music industry. Where do you see house music going in the next 10 years? Hmm, uh, that's a good question. I mean, of course, the last 10 years, like the whole vinyl thing is gone pretty much for the most part. It's become all of a digital stage. Um, I don't know where it can advance from there. I mean, now the latest thing with, um, in terms of what I use, I don't ever use computers in a club, which, you know, has been another big advancement. But what you can do with the new CD players is you can use a USB stick in one of the CDJ 2000s by Pioneer, and you could they could talk to all the CD players out of one USB. So that's kind of a newer advancement. I used to be strict with just CDs playing stuff and so now I've sort of made that transition into using a USB. I'm still, I like the Pioneer CDJ2000. I still have all my records of course, I keep them all, but I tend not to bring them out sparingly. They still stay at home and I love to play records at home, but I still find a clubs, vinyl isn't just a, like clubs isn't a friendly place for records, it takes a certain uh, I don't know, art to set up a proper turntable. And in terms of genres in the future, I don't know where they'll be. I mean, for me, what I started out in is Chicago House kind of encompasses all different genres of house, be it electro, minimal, techno, disco house, vocal, whatever, it all kind of stems from that early Chicago House sound. So in terms of a new genre popping up in the next 10 years, I don't know what it could be that would hasn't been sort of done already, so to speak. Um, like you know like just Chicago house for me is so many different what we call like whatever different people call subgenres of that exist like you know like there's so many different names it's just house to me it's all house music so um, clubs seem to be getting a little more futuristic and um, I mean I, I like to see improvements in sound systems which is uh, is happening a lot in different places you know different sound companies come out and uh, different promoters have more of a knack for getting good sound in clubs so that's a good thing to see progressing and you being from Chicago, was your first love house music? Um, oh, I mean, my first love was kind of industrial new wave, I guess, pre-house. Um, my early teen club years were, um, I was into a label called Wax Tracks, which was a Chicago record store. Like the groups like Ministry, Front 242 um, were on. So I kind of came from an industrial edge, the first clubs I went to. Um, we call it yeah, industrial kind of dance music, but it was all heavily mixed in Chicago. Chicago was always a big mixing town from the early 80s on, so everything was blended. So and then from there, I got into more acid tracks and minimal housey stuff at the time. So that was my bridge from, say, I mean, even prior to industrial, I was into like Police and The Fix and Smiths and things like that, New Order, and then sort of got into more industrial stuff and then into house and then into more hip hop. Awesome. Now, you created a genre of music, Mushroom Jazz. Was that by accident, or did you intend to do that? Um, yes and no. It was kind of by accident. I, was, I mean, it was on purpose, but it became sort of a... It stuck around till this day, sort of by accident. Didn't really anticipate it becoming sort of its own subgenre, so to speak. It was kind of a combination of East Coast, New York-style hip-hop of the late 80s, early 90s, like De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, mixed with, like, the UK acid jazz, sound and like the French kind of hip-hop sound all kind of mixed into one I sort of made it as like a sort of your pre-party or after-party mix cassette because in the record store I worked at at the time we would sell cassettes because everything was mixed tape prior to CDs and I made a mushroom jazz cassette and it turned out to be uh, quite a popular you know pre-party post-party soundtrack and now you know we're whatever up to seven volumes working on eight on CD and um, it's been around for something like 20 years so it sort of seems to endure time with its sort of jazzy, instrumentally hip-hop vibe that it has, and it's still going strong. 
And what was it like creating this new genre of music? And, you know, in the very beginning, it wasn't what, you know, people were used to listening to and what they expected to hear. Like, how did you deal with that? And what kind of reaction did you get at first? Um, I mean, at first, like I said, Chicago was such a house town. People didn't want to hear anything slower than 120 beats per minute, which is about as slow as house gets is 120. It's even Chicago is generally faster, 125. Whereas mushroom jazz is around 100 beats per minute, which so I couldn't really play it anywhere. Um, in Chicago, it was like I finally got like a gig playing it in sort of like the chill room of a club with sofas. Like it wasn't dance floor music. Like people wouldn't dance to it. It was sort of unheard of in Chicago that you would dance to something so slow. And then it wasn't until I started playing in San Francisco where people were a little more open to different tempos, where there was actually a dance floor scene to that mushroom jazz sound. You know, like when I first came to San Francisco in around 92, 93, there was sort of acid jazz scene going on where people were kind of open to dance to that sort of slower tempo. Whereas in Chicago, I tried it and it was always like more head nod music. Like people would just be like hanging out, like nobody would dance. So. It's definitely an uphill battle at first. It was like traditionally known as B-room music, you would call it. So, yeah, a lot of the recognition that I got from it was more like someone listening to it at their house at an after party or like a pool party the next day where people have been up all night and they sort of throw in mushroom jazz cassette and it seems to fit the moment. So at first it wasn't a really clubby sound at all for many years. I really admire that you took a chance and now it's become a new genre of music which is just amazing. You must be really proud of that. Yeah, I, I mean like I said, I don't know. I like I wouldn't have planned out like, oh, I'm going to create some new subgenre of whatever chill, you know, mellowish music. Uh, I don't I wouldn't have planned on it, but it just so happens that it's sort of created its own niche amongst like ambient, chill, B-room, whatever. Uh, abstract beat, down tempo music that's still to this day kind of when you say mushroom jazz, if people are, you know, into electronic like history of music, they sort of know that sound instantly or what it is. So, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. It's very, it's such a cool thing. Awesome. And what advice do you have for young DJs and house music producers like myself? Um, I mean, of course, you know, you got to do your homework and practice, mix at home, make mixes. I think it also doesn't hurt to make tunes. Like find the labels you like and ma you know like make tracks that sort of fit those sounds. Like send them to the labels you like because you, know, you can get recommended by other DJs at another club somewhere. Is probably might be the person who's gonna like recommend you, you know, unless you have like a hit single or something where you know people are gonna know your song and ask for it. Um, but I mean, for my style, like I mean, my what got me a lot more gigs was just making mixtapes. Like I said at the time, I'd make a new tape a week, then eventually CDs. You know, now podcasts. But it was making a lot of mixes at home in your spare time and giving them out to whoever. Um, I mean, now there's SoundCloud, which I would say SoundCloud is a great way to put out mixes. I love SoundCloud. It's like a instantaneous mixtape basically where you can kind of get instant gratification from stuff you know if you're not making a lot of tunes which you know is something I really haven't done necessarily tons of I didn't do a lot of production I think myself and like Doc Martin are two of the kind of housey DJs that have still kind of gotten most of our gigs from DJing other shows and not necessarily making a ton of records um, so we're sort of a minority in that respect but I think getting your name to other DJs to get your foot in the door of other places to spin making records other than doing mixes is a great way to do that. So what do you have going on in 2013? What can we look out for? Uh, let's see, uh, just came out as a new Coyote Cut CD um, label from Detroit Coyote Cuts, Urban Coyotes, they're like a house label from Detroit and I compiled stuff off their label. They've got tons of releases. That just came out a couple weeks ago. Working on Mushroom Jazz Aid for Ohm Records, which should be out summer. Uh, my own label, Great Lakes Audio, is a kind of Chicago Midwestern -y house label. Uh, the next thing coming out in that is called Mr. Mushroom Man. Um, it's kind of mushroomy theme house stuff. And then there's releases coming out on that all summer. And that's kind of my house, whatever, out outreach label. And yeah, just keeping the keeping the podcast going every month and touring now. The other thing we're doing this summer is I'm playing a lot of dates. Uh, I think we're doing like five or six dates at the moment with uh, Derek Carter and Sneak and we play all at the same time on two sets of mixers and uh, CDJs and stuff and play over each other. We don't have a name for our, our group yet. We're sort of throwing around different names but it's yeah it's sort of our kind of I mean for me my best house buddies and we're sort of like a little kind of all-star little house lineup between Sneak Derek and I. So we're playing like six festivals this summer in Europe and the plans on coming, doing that in the States as well. So. Awesome.
Um, and you've been working with Derek Carter from the beginning. Yeah, for 20 years now. He's still one of my best old buddies. We used to, we used to work at Gramophone together. He was my, we were first roommates together when we moved out of our parents back in around whatever that was, 89. Awesome. So keep in touch with him regularly. So where can people find you? Uh, DJMarkFrina.net, um, my website, uh, SoundCloud, I'm just DJ Mark Frina on SoundCloud, I mean at the moment right there there's like 30 mixes spanning the whole 20 years that are all downloadable today. Um, I like to make stuff accessible so yeah, between those two places and I'm on Twitter, DJ Mark Frina on Twitter, I just started Instagram this week, I sort of have a hobby of doing photography so I finally started my Instagram account this week. I used to just post all my photos on Twitter but um, so yeah, those are all the places. Very cool. Check out Mark Farina. Follow him. Twitter, Instagram. Check out his website, his mixes. He's amazing. Living legend. Thank you so much for being with us, Mark. It was such a pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.